Thanks guys for joining for the Wealth Talk. Um, this is kind of the idea here is I went through the last, I mean, honestly, the last four years, but especially the last uh, like a year and a half going through uh, creating the actual wealth plan, right? So a lot of this is based loosely off of this financial mentor course that I took, um, which walks you through like first understanding your whys, like, like, like what do you really want, right? Like what, what's the whole point of this, like ordering your career and your wealth plan around uh, certain financial goals, like what does it get you? And then it steps you through essentially the different paths that do that, right? So that's like paper assets, kind of what you traditionally think of as retirement. So like stocks, bonds, mutual funds, stuff like that. And then alternative assets. So this would be real estate investing, business, stuff like that. And then eventually uh, kind of uh, wrapping this all up in a plan. So at the end here, what I'll uh, show you guys is the actual plan I came up with, right? So like what I'm actually doing, uh, like why I moved back to Seattle, started a company, uh, and kind of the whole plan over the next uh, six and a half years until I hit my financial independence number. And I'll go over all that in detail. Um, but I kind of wanted to give you guys some context as to uh, one, some of the learnings, and two, a lot of the kind of like mental frameworks and kind of mind shifts that I went through on this process. And hopefully you guys can take some of these learnings or at least kind of spark some ideas as to how you could approach this uh, in, in your life. And I've got a list of educational resources and also action steps that you can take at the end of this. So uh, if you want, you can fast forward to those little sections, but I highly recommend kind of, you know, going through the rest of this uh, before hitting that. All right. Did you have a question, Joe? How do I fast forward? <laughs> oh, well, he linked the PowerPoint so you can... Uh, oh, I see. It. Yes. Okay. I thought you were speaking to the future viewers. So before <laughs> I get started here, a little disclaimer, I'm not a financial expert. Uh, most of you guys probably know that, but uh, just, I mean, for legal reasons, talk to your CPA, talk to your lawyer. Um, uh, legally, you can't give unsolicited uh, advice regarding sp securities specifically. Uh, I try to stay away from that, that but just like, again, a disclaimer that any personalized stuff should really be talked over with your professionals. All right, so why give this talk? I kind of went into it a little bit, but uh, this knowledge has legitimately changed my life, right? I mean, we'll see what happens, but I truly think that it's uh, possible to hit financial independence within 10 years, assuming market conditions that we've seen in the past or uh, over the 100, uh, past 100 years in the US. Like if that pattern continues, like I really think that 10 years is realistic for the vast majority of people. Um, I'll get into why, but this is powerful stuff. Right, and, and I'm always amazed how many people spend their entire lives, right? So 40 years, uh, eight hours a day, at kind of a minimum, you know, a lot more than that people don't save for retirement, um, and get to the end of that, and you know, they don't necessarily have a specific goal that they're approaching, right? And a lot of people don't even enjoy their day-to-day -day jobs. So my, my goal here is to really show that you can, one, figure out what those goals are, and thus what you really should be kind of, like what you want to be working towards, and two, should save yourself a ton of time. Right, so kind of becoming much more efficient and really uh, hitting those goals as opposed to just kind of stumbling along in life, which is the vast majority of people. So that's that's why I'm so passionate about this stuff, right? Is it really is a, a life changer, and it's not just financial goals; it's uh, life goals and, and really empowering those. So uh, another big part of this is being able to transfer wisdom from a lifetime of building businesses, of you know building communities, and uh, really going through all this to people that are younger and that can really leverage that knowledge, right? And that can really incorporate that in their life. So that's a lot of what this wealth course has been. And what I hope to share with you. So, okay, first off, what is financial independence? So financial independence is essentially retirement, but without the stigma of retirement. So the idea is uh, getting to the point where you've got enough money coming into your bank account uh, on a mostly passive uh, uh, way. So that means you know not actually like going out there and working uh, your time for it, but having passive income coming into your bank account that matches your expenses, right? So this would uh, basically allow you to live forever without doing much work. And I say much work in the sense of real estate is a, a common way that people achieve financial independence, but you still have occasionally, you know, like need to repaint the house or kind of dealing with some of those maintenance issues. So, the, uh, but like getting to the point where you're mostly passive. So how realistic is achieving FI? Uh, like I mentioned, I think it's totally doable within 10 years and you'll see how uh, as we get into this. And then one thing I do wanna mention, there's a lot of stigma around financial independence and especially anything to do with finance, right? And this comes from a lot of cultural things or even just how you're brought up. So I like to frame money as an amplifier, right? It's not inherently good or bad, it's more of uh, something that just amplifies who you are. Right? and like allows you to have more power and control and essentially to really amplify what you wanna do. And again, that could be both good or bad. 
as shown by the Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> uh, okay, so first part of this is the wealth plan blueprint. So again, this is kind of going through the elements of what comprises a wealth plan. So this is kind of more of the educational piece. All right, so the first and most important piece to all of this is to really figure out what your why is. This is common advice, and I feel like it's uh, dramatically undervalued, at least given what I've seen uh, with people I've spoken with. So that's why I said, seriously do it. I think that knowing your why and really having a clear understanding of, again, what you're trying to accomplish, right? And like what your end goals are is incredibly important. Given that this entire structure, right, of your career, of the time that you spend working for money is ultimately there to serve those goals, right? To serve the goals that you want to achieve. Um, so figuring out what those are before you go about building a career is critically important. Um, and this is a big step that I took time to really go through and process, like, what do I care about? So for me personally, uh, my life mission statement is to systematically empower young Christian leaders and just young leaders overall as well. Um, so that I can take and then kind of back away from uh, all kinds of different strategies, right? So for example, given this talk and like really understanding the wealth side allows me to be a better mentor and to be a better, uh, to really lay out kind of the keys to the kingdom of capitalism to mentees and to really help empower them through that knowledge. So um, again, like having clarity with that and then be able to kind of back into like, what am I doing now that gets to that end goal? Like who am I becoming through my career? Who am I becoming through the businesses I'm building that will better bring myself to that position? So that's uh, a little bit about the why. Um, uh, the path of, to financial independence is about fulfillment, not money. As I mentioned, it's, it's really about empowering those goals and those dreams, right? Like, where do you want to be? What kind of family life do you have? What kind of career aspirations do you want to meet? And instead of being locked into some job that you hate. Um, and then an important way to think about your why is to really look at your day to day, right? So to kind of think through, like, what do I want to be doing on a daily basis? Now, this is easy to kind of forget as we're all so focused on those longer term goals, right? Like what's my salary? What's uh, the retirement uh, benefits? Kind of, you know, the long term stuff, but really thinking about your day to day. Uh, so for example, for me, I really enjoy kind of the act of helping people through solving business problems, right? So like being able to work with a small entrepreneur and say, uh, okay, you've got this expensive problem that's costing you tens of thousands of dollars per year with my software skills, I can go in and fix that, right? And be able to deliver this end result. I really enjoy that communication and that product management piece. So for me, that was a huge insight to really see how, you know, driving my why, and then uh, in addition to that, what my day-to-day -day could, uh, could look like to get to that and making sure that it's sustainable. Um, so again, really looking at what you enjoy doing day-to-day, -day, and then from there, reverse engineering your plan around it to kind of encompass more of what you enjoy doing day-to-day. Um, I'll give more concrete examples of this later on, but again, a, and a good example of this is me going from working in a company uh, as a specialist to starting a company where I'm doing a specialist work as an engineer, but also doing the consulting and the you know, communication side of it. Great, and then uh, one last thing, the freestyle writing exercise. Uh, I will detail this later, so I won't go into it, but that's the best way I can uh, recommend to really dive into finding out what your whys are and becoming more clear on that. All right, number two, knowing your numbers. Uh, this is pretty straightforward, basically tracking your spending and tracking your time. Uh, these are two of the largest things that you have control over, right? Like right now, these are the two biggest levers, so to speak, that you can pull, which is one, what are you spending your money on, right? Like what are your expenses? How, um, I mean, the classic example is how many lattes are you buying? But honestly, what's more important is uh, what's your housing expense, right? Because I believe that's about 33% of most people's expenses, housing, and then 17% of that is transportation. So if you think about it, like those two alone account for way more than your entire latte bill for a month could be. So really looking at kind of these um, automatic, if you will, or uh, reoccurring expenses and being very deliberate with how you're spending. So for example, maybe getting a smaller place close to where you work versus a larger place out of the city that you have to drive to. Um, and then in addition to that time, so commuting time, uh, but really just how productive you are throughout the day. Uh, I have some great recommendations for tools later on as to how to uh, track these, uh, but just one thing I wanna point out that getting clarity on that is the first step to being able to control it, right? Like you can't control what you don't know, so uh, it's very well worthwhile to spend time looking into that. 
Okay, second point here, your income doesn't matter. <laughs> so, you know, this is kind of an interesting statement, but what it gets at is how much somebody makes really doesn't matter. I mean, you could be making half a million, or multiple million dollars a year, but if you're not saving <clears throat> any of it, then it doesn't really get you anywhere, right? And especially from a financial standpoint, it, it actually doesn't get you anywhere. So what matters is saving the difference between your income and the expenses you have, right? And this is why, like, you'll see the occasional teacher that was making 45K a year as a multimillionaire uh, real estate investor later on, right? Because she or he was able to invest in real estate slowly but diligently uh, and amass a lot of uh, money over time because they're saving. And at the same time, you see a lot of pro athletes who make an ungodly amount of money that go bankrupt because they don't save their money. So again, it doesn't matter how much you make, it matters how much you save. And I think that that framework is a really uh, powerful way to look at things, especially when it comes to maybe taking a lower salary in exchange for uh, longer term career investment or career opportunities, or even just for uh, self-fulfillment, but just knowing that you can still achieve those financial goals, not making as much. Um, okay, how long until you're financially independent? So this is a, a quote I love from one of my mentors. So how long does it take? Uh, he says, look at how much time you spend trading time for money versus spent creating leveraged growth. So basically what this means is look at your day, right? Look at your calendar, uh, like for a specific day, and how much time do you spend trading your time for money, right? So working as an hourly uh, so, uh, employee versus creating uh, wealth. Right or creating something that's going to last long term. So a good example of this would be investing in real estate or um, speculative uh, cryptocurrency investing, like one of my good friends. Or joking about that one, but uh, actually, you know, building little assets that can uh, give you long term wealth. And that's more of kind of a time reminder. All right. So any questions so far with what I've covered? Okay. Perfect. I'll just uh, be asking some uh, periodic questions mm -hmm. to see if you guys are uh, have any questions. Okay. It will be a test. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so paper yes. asset investing. Uh, so paper assets include stocks, bonds, mutual funds, index funds. I won't go into depth here uh, because I've covered it in other areas, but uh, a couple key points here. First, your savings rate is priority number one, right? Or priority zero in an in, in engineering sense. Uh, basically meaning that your savings rate is the first thing, uh, kind of going off of what I just said, that has one, the most power to influence your plan, and two, if you think about your portfolio as the collection of everything, like all your assets, right, and all your, just all the money you have, um, the biggest return on that portfolio in terms of percentage growth is in your savings rate until you hit quite a bit of net worth, right? So for example, let's say you have $20,000 saved. Um, your ability to save an additional $10,000 per year on top of that is a huge, I mean, that's a 50% uh, re like return on your portfolio's investment the first year, mm -hmm. right? If, if you're following the logic there, as opposed to, let's say you put that in the stock market and on a really good year, you get a 20% return, right? I mean, the amount you save completely dwarfs the amount that you were able to earn on that investment, if that makes sense. Now, eventually you'll get to the point where you've got maybe a million dollars in, in like savings, right? And then that 20% on that million, uh, $20,000 is, no, $200,000, my, my math is right here. $200,000 is way more than the uh, like $10,000 you were able to save, if that kind of makes sense. So eventually it flips to where your investments matter a lot more to your overall wealth in, in terms of their yeah, annual like return uh, than your savings. But for now, and probably for quite a while, your savings are the biggest uh, chain or lever you can pull, right? So really focusing on your savings, which again, doesn't necessarily need mean uh, needing to make more money, but it's just increasing that delta between what you make and what you spend. Uh, that's the biggest lever you can pull. So just kind of, uh, I think an interesting way to think about things, but that's what I focus on now. Um, the, the next couple steps are to fully fund any tax advantaged accounts. Again, something I would defer you to uh, your tax attorney uh, to talk more about, but in short, Roth IRA and 401k with any uh, employee uh, contribution matching that your employer might offer. Like those are the, the first two I'd recommend. I personally don't invest in tax deferred accounts outside of that, but that's more of a, uh, like a lot of people disagree with me on that. So uh, just a word of advice there. The second uh, piece of advice is the low cost passive index buy and hold strategy. So um, 
I, you can ask people, or I can give you more information about this. Vanguard talks a lot about it, but using that strategy has been a, a very cost-effective strategy over the last uh, 80 plus years in the U.S. So I'd highly recommend investing those accounts and then investing in, in uh, the low-cost uh, passive index buy-and-hold type investments. Um, and again, I, I can't give specific securities, but that's generally like what I would I would recommend. And there's a lot of research backing that up. Uh, okay, one interesting thing is the reverse or the uh, like flipped four percent rule. Mm -hmm. So basically, what this states so the four percent rule is kind of a guideline for uh, for retirement. And the, the basic thing is okay, how much do I need to save so that I can in retirement spend X amount per year, right? And one thing to keep in mind whenever retirement or like uh, financial advisors talk about retirement it almost always assumes that you're gonna amortize your assets over 30 years. Meaning that let's say you, you know, save up $2 million, by the end of 30 years, you'll have zero dollars, right? And like most people don't realize that this is the way that financial advisors talk, but it's, it's assuming that you deplete all your assets, right? Which is kind of depressing in the sense that, you know, if you're 65, I mean, you're assuming you're gonna die by 95. Um, and another part of this is if you ever meet old people that like have a ton of money, but just can't spend any of it, a lot of it is this, this fear that stems from spending your entire savings, right? Like you're actually spending down your nest egg, which if you don't want to be working when you're 95 years old, you've got to hope that that's going to, you know, uh, hold, hold true. So one thing to kind of think about is the 4% rule, which is a way to gauge how much you need. And generally speaking, for every $1,000 a month in passive income that you want in retirement, you need roughly three hundred dollars to $400,000 of assets saved. And that's, that's a lot, right? If you think about, you know, let's say you want $5,000 per month. I mean, that's, you know, somewhere between, oh man, I, I gotta stop, make myself do math on the fly here. <laughs> but that's somewhere between uh, $20,000 and, uh, what would that be, $12,000? Well, anyways, that's somewhere around $18,000, right? If you kind of uh, average it out there. Uh, the, uh, sorry, when I say $18,000, I mean uh, $1.8 million in assets that you would need in order to have $5,000 per month. So. Just something to keep in mind. Now, that's with paper assets. With real estate or with any sources of cash flow that could generate, let's say, $5,000, like a, an apartment building or something, you need dramatically less financial uh, investment in order to make that return. But for paper assets, so stocks, bonds, that kind of stuff, the 4% rule, aka the $1,000 a month for every 300 to 400K you have, is, is a pretty good guideline. Um, one thing I'll mention here quickly is sequence of returns risk. Uh, there's a lot of context here, so I'll just say that this is a scary thing when you go into retirement or start living off of your assets, and then all of a sudden the market drops. Uh, essentially, you can burn through your entire like 30-year portfolio in like seven or eight years uh, if we went through what we saw in 08, uh, and you were spending down at your normal rate. So again, there's a lot of uh, compounding the math and stuff that goes into this, but just something to be aware with a conventional retirement portfolio. So that brings us to the next kind of asset, which is real estate investing. Uh, so the first piece here, going off of what I just mentioned, is that cash flow rocks and amortization is for retirees. Basically meaning that if you have a time horizon of over 30 years that you could be living, right? So I would roughly guess, you know, well, live to be 100, right? Like that's a fairly safe estimate. So until you're 70, you really can't retire off of a traditional portfolio unless you've got, you know, tons of wealth, right? Like, I mean, millions more than you probably need. Um, because, again, of that amortization equation, right? So that spending down of your entire asset base over 30 years. Right? So you have to really pad it just to be safe if you're going to be under 30 years. Now, uh, for people in the 20 to 30 year old range, uh, you really can't trust <laughs> that you'll have enough money over 70 or so years. I mean, that's, that's pretty ludicrous time range, which means that you are much better or you can much more accurately predict how much money you need by going with cash flow per, uh, driving assets as opposed to your conventional retirement plan. So what does this mean? Uh, this could mean a couple things. Uh, the easiest example is real estate, where you get a check each month from your renters. Uh, that, you know, that's cash flow, right? That's cash that's coming into your pocket. And again, that's minus any expenses you might have. So real estate's incredible because it's, it's very versatile. And again, there's a lot of context here, but, but just it, it's a much more bulletproof way to, to live through retirement, where you know like, okay, I'm spending $5,000 a month, 
and I've got $5,000 a month coming in from cash. So it's a pretty easy equation and there's no termination, at least with real estate, where all of a sudden the real estate's gonna be uh, bad that way. Um, one really important piece of this too is real estate, given that inflation, so you know the rise in, in our costs of food, of, of rent, of all that stuff, that inflation is, uh, or that real estate essentially is indexed to inflation. Right? I mean, literally the inflation indexes use like rent prices. <laughs> so as your cost of living, it goes up over time, right? As inflation eats away at your money, uh, real estate automatically follows that. So that again, when you're trying to figure out how much money you need, real estate automatically uh, uh, like adjusts to like the cost of living. Because let's say that we see 20% inflation over the next couple of years. Well, real estate rents will also inflate by about 20%. And thus, you know, it makes the math very simple. Um, this is also true with most businesses in the sense of, uh, you know, going to get a coffee, right? Or like, like the money that a restaurant could bring in. For the most part, uh, they're just going to raise their prices along with inflation and thus it automatically adjusts. But this is not the case with stocks and bonds. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot more complicated math there. So all that to say, cash flow is, is, is great. It's, it's not stressful. It's easy to figure out how much you need. And it's just like a rock solid way to go. Um, one thing I'll note too. There are ways through uh, derivatives uh, or dividends rather to accomplish the same thing through paper assets. So it's not that you can't do it with stocks and bonds. It's that you have to employ a different strategy that usually requires a little bit more money to, to make happen. Cool. Um, okay. One thing or two more things I'll mention. One, the risk characteristics and then the five advantages to real estate. So the, the asymmetric risk characteristics in comparison to paper assets. So what does that mean? Uh, there are two types of risk. There's security, uh, security specific risk, and then there's some, uh, um, is, uh, uh, oh my gosh, uh, symmetric risk. So basically risks that are um, uh, across an entire like economy. Uh, so this, the security specific risk would be, uh, let's say Apple goes out of business, right? Like that's probably not gonna affect many other companies, but it sure as heck is gonna affect the stock price of Apple, right? Like it'll go from whatever it's at today down to zero. Now, systemic risk would be like what we saw in 2008, where the entire stock market crashes, right? Now, systemic risk does also carry over in some parts from paper assets to real estate, but in a much less direct way than, uh, for example, like owning Apple stock versus Facebook stock. Like the correlation between those in a down market is very, very similar. Uh, where in real estate, you can hedge some of that risk by being in different um, uh, like local economies. So I won't bore you guys with too many details there, but all that to say, there are some great uh, risk benefits to real estate investing, or at least you have more control over it. All right, uh, the last thing here are the five amazing parts of real estate. So you have cash flow, which I've talked about at length, tax sheltering, which basically means that, again, roughly speaking, the tax that you generate from real estate, or the income that you generate from real estate will be tax-free given uh, uh, mortgage deductions uh, from like interest payments. And then uh, in addition to that, being able to depreciate the value of the house. Uh, so that's a huge benefit. Amortization, which basically means having your renters essentially pay down your loan over time, right? Like the money that they're sending to you, you take a chunk of that and you send it back to the bank and that automatically pays down the mortgage loan on a rental property. So over time, your rental property gets paid off and that, that process is called amortization. Appreciation, very straightforward. House goes up in value over a couple of years. On average, uh, real estate uh, appreciates about 3% a year, which is slightly higher than uh, uh, the inflation that we've seen. In certain markets, such as the Puget Sound, we've seen much greater appreciation over the last 50 years than that. But that's kind of a, you shouldn't bet on that, but that's like a great benefit. And then the last one is leverage, which is the ability to take the bank's money and buy way more property, usually 80% uh, uh, more property than you could with just your own money. Right, which I mean, that's pretty obvious, right? Being able to buy, put 40% down with a 20% down loan, sorry, put $40,000 down on a 20% down loan for a 200K property uh, versus having to take the time to save up for that full 200K. All right, any questions about the real estate stuff? Justin has two on the chat. Okay. We have a question from one of our viewers. <laughs> uh, when you say live through retirement, do you mean live through financial independence? Yes, yeah, thank you. So when I say retirement, um, it's really meaning the same thing as financial independence. Financial independence is just a more agnostic way to say it. 
Um, so thank you. Uh, uh, yes, and the other one is, can you explain tax sheltering more? Yeah, so tax sheltering is essentially, uh, I mean, just think of it as like tax deductions that you get on uh, whatever income. So in this case, uh, so you have different tax uh, uh, um, classifications for income, right? So you've got capital gains, short and long term, you've got earned income, and you've got passive income. So a lot of times rental property is passive income. Um, the cool thing is uh, you can have deductions against that income, right? So if you think about a business and business expenses, you essentially can spend, you know, Let's say you can make $50,000, but if you're also spending $50,000 on employee salary and new equipment and kind of reinvesting in, you, you essentially have a full write-off for that same amount. Uh, the same thing applies in real estate. And the two vehicles for that are tax deductions through mortgage payments in addition to depreciation. So taking, let's say you're, you know, uh, you buy a house for $800,000. Let's say the land is roughly 400 k of the value and then the rest of the 400 k is the house. Um, the tax uh, code just changed in the U.S., so I'm not entirely sure what the new schedule is. But in the past, I believe over 29 and a half years, you could you could basically divide the, the, the 400k of the house by a, roughly 30 and deduct that per year against your income, right? So $400,000 divided by all that per year, in addition to the operation expenses of the property, I mean, completely wipes out the uh, expense that you would have, uh, like in terms of the money that you make from the rental property. In addition to that, a lot of times that same tax benefit can apply towards your normal salary, right? So like most of you guys, if you're a W-2 employee or even running your own business, can take the tax shelter from real estate and, and like maybe you know save a couple thousand dollars in taxes a year by applying that towards your own income. So it's just a really uh, efficient way. And if you think about it, our government wants to incentivize people to provide housing. Right, so they, they have these tax benefits that essentially incentivize investors to deploy capital in a way that's going to uh, cost them less than tax. Uh, in, in exchange, the government gets uh, a greater supply of people providing housing. So, okay. we yes. have more questions from the viewers. Yes. Any questions. additional questions? And remember, guys, we're tweeting with the hashtag Patrick's Well. Often, <laughs> so uh, he goes uh, fully fund tax advantage comps. Uh, what happens if I take out money early? Do I end up losing money? Um, okay, so the question is regarding uh, uh, tax advantaged accounts. So this would be like a Roth IRA or a four hundred one k. Do you lose money when you take out if you take out money early? Uh, so before you're fifty nine and a half, uh, or depending on the different uh, 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 account. So the answer to that is it depends, and you should talk to your tax attorney. <laughs> but in short, uh, okay, I'll, I'll say for the Roth IRA, um, like you can take out your principal, right? So let's say I put $25,000 into my Roth IRA over the last five years. Uh, I can take that $25,000 out, but I can't take out the additional amount that I made on uh, the stock market, right? So maybe I've made $5,000 and uh, you know, it being invested. Uh, those I can't take out without penalties and without uh, additional fees. Now again, this gets really tricky and there are all kinds of edge cases, so definitely uh, do some research online, talk to your uh, uh, professional, but that's the general uh, okay. example. Another one. <laughs> there are. <laughs> Last one. Uh, does putting savings straight into investments count as savings, or that is that investment? It does. Uh, putting money straight into uh, investments count as savings. It, uh, I, I would say yes. Um, people have different philosophies on this. Basically, uh, it, it, well, okay. I, I would say yes, and, and just to paint a little bit more of a picture here, um, if you uh, have enough money coming in to where like you're basically financially independent, um, having savings mathematically doesn't really help you much. Uh, again, there's a lot of math behind this, but basically it's good to just invest all your money um, for the most part in like keeping a small uh, liquid cash savings. Now, before you get to that point, when you're dependent on an employer or like your own business and not at the financial independence, then it, it, it's better to have a lot of, or like a, a good chunk of savings, like a six month emergency fund. Um, so yes, basically I would count any money that's not spent, uh, in terms of expenses that are, are gone as savings. Um, and one note there, I'd also not count, like, for example, I bought a used car, paid for it in cash. I would not count that as savings. I would count that as an expenditure, um, cause it's an asset that will depreciate over time. Cool. All right. Well, I will go into the last, uh, business asset or the last asset class here, which is business. Uh, this is, in my opinion, the most exciting uh, because it's the most versatile, and there's a lot of a lot of really cool stuff you can do here. One thing I'll mention too that's really surprising. So, 
going through this wealth plan, it's, it's amazing to see how most financial advisors don't ever speak to any of these other parts outside of the paper assets, right? Like they don't tell you about, well, usually about like the real estate benefits that you have or this idea of the business asset class, right? And creating little passive web, uh, 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 income from websites and stuff like that. They really just speak to the paper assets and they also don't take into account your yourself, right? Your why, your time horizon, uh, your age, your interests, your passions, your talents, like like what experience and skill set do you have? Um, where, actually I'm gonna pause while Please. this camera. Great, where the, um, on the other hand, uh, there's a lot more that goes into all that, right? To really fit you personally. So the business asset class does incorporate a lot of that. Really, it, it does take into consideration like your skills and your unique advantages and all that good stuff. Um, but it's, it's important to kind of take a step back and really look holistically at your portfolio, right? So like not just kind of shoehorning yourself into some investment class, but figuring out like, okay, yeah, maybe paper assets make sense, but in a limited scope. Maybe for me, it's really about real estate. And like, that's where I'm going to focus my time. Or maybe for you, it's really about building the business and then maybe kind of saving your money into real estate or into paper assets. But important to note that it's not a one size fits all. It's definitely not a one size fits all uh, um, process coming up with your wealth plan. It's very custom. And all that coming back to the business asset class being something that I would really heavily consider, uh, at least looking into a little bit to see if it fits for you, given that most advice does not talk at all about real estate investing or business uh, asset classes. So quickly, uh, the vast majority of people, I think roughly 80% that have made uh, the Forbes uh, 500 list are have done it through business, have done it through creating some sort of business asset. Um, Business is the fastest path to generating growth. Um, and it's also, and that's mainly because of the leverage opportunities. So I will cover leverage in a little bit, but the idea is being able to accelerate the growth of wealth or the growth of a company much faster than you would be able to do on your own. So a very easy example of this would be instead of you uh, developing a bunch of websites and trying to build a business, it'd be hiring a team and leveraging their time to build the websites uh, while you help scale the business. So that's Sorry. one huge benefit to business asset classes, to be able to use leverage. Um, as I mentioned, it's the most personal, uh, true diversification potential. So without going into too much detail here, you can really securely diversify against risks that could bring down your real estate portfolio or bring down your paper assets portfolio. Um, one example of this would be uh, let's say that you're a real estate investor, right? And, and keep in mind too, the business asset class is like a very close cousin to the real estate class because real estate is technically a business. Um, but let's say that you're a real estate investor. You can have passive income coming in from long-term buy and hold real estate, right? Stuff that you buy and you just plan to hold for a long time and have renters in. But you can also generate money by flipping houses, right? Which is very different. You don't have renters in. You're basically buying a house, doing a bunch of work to it, and then selling it. For a profit. Um, you could be in a market where it's really tough to rent or it's, you know, the renting is going really well and have the uh, inverse of that true flipping. So a great example of this would be 2008, 2009, where it'd be really, really tough to have been a flipper in most areas, given that the market had essentially collapsed and there were very few buyers. But at the same time, in most areas, specifically speaking to the Puget Sound, the rents did not go down at all. In fact, rents went up in 2011, 2012 in, in areas around the Puget Sound. So there, the real estate investing was essentially unfazed, right? If, if you're just holding on to your, your property, but flipping would have been really tough. So you can see with business asset classes, there's more ability to kind of manage risk so that if you have your portfolio, you can be more secure that you're not gonna lose a bunch of money or be out of cash for that, that month. <clears throat> In addition to that, business asset is the most active. So, you know, paper assets are very passive in the sense of you invest in them and you don't really think a whole lot about it except for checking your Schwab account or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, real estate investing is a bit more active. You have a little bit of latitude here, but most people, you know, have to buy the property, go through all the paperwork, uh, manage the property managers or manage directly the renters. Uh, so doing some painting, you know, scrubbing toilets, kind of all the stuff you normally hear about. Um, and then business is very active, of course. And I, I mean, you guys all understand that, but building something from scratch takes, of course, a tremendous amount of time. So it has all these benefits, but it also has a drawback of time. So that's one thing to kind of think about when you're piecing together your plan is like, do I really love my career? 
right? Like, am I really fulfilled by what I do day to day? Well, then maybe the paper asset class, even though it does have, you know, a number of inherent flaws, maybe that's the best because that will still get you to financial independence, but it will just take longer. Um, but again, if you enjoy what you're doing day to day, then that could be a good a compliment. Now, if you hate your job and you are really passionate about some other business idea, approaching it in the right way through business could be a much better way to go. And you can amass a much a greater amount of wealth doing something you enjoy and get out of that scenario that you don't want to be in much faster than you could with paper assets. Um, and that's where it's sad to see people that are working for 40 plus years and eight to nine, you know, nine to five job that they hate. Because there are ways to not do that, but society, and without getting too conspiracy here, a lot of the big financial institutions have a very vested interest in telling people that there's only one way to go about it, which is that high paying job and then investing all your money to, into Wall Street. Um, so yeah, just one thing to think about with business is it's, uh, it's a good counterbalance to other paths. All right, so we're almost done with these last two sections uh, for kind of the blueprint. And then the other sections are a lot quicker, so don't worry. <laughs> um, but the first step here is leverage. Um, so again, leverage is essentially making an end goal uh, come much faster, right? So being able to accelerate the growth. And a, a very obvious example, in addition to the employee example I gave earlier, is buying a rental property with financial leverage. Right, going to the bank and getting an 80% loan on the property. So instead of you know taking the time to save up $200,000, you could you only have to save up $40,000 for the for the 20% down payment on a $200,000 property. So that's an uh, example of where leverage, financial leverage, greatly accelerates your ability to start investing in real estate and kind of get that compounding cycle rolling. So there are basically like six main types of leverage. So financial, which I just mentioned time which the employee example with the business was a great example of. Um, technology and systems. Uh, a very clear example of this would be um, if you've ever seen uh, you know, like macros on Word or you know, people that have to like write a bunch, of, oh, I guess a good example of this would be going from a typewriter to a computer, right? Like having to manually type everything every time to a computer where you can just have a Word uh, template and then you know, make everything happen there. So any system or technology, and when you kind of start to think about it and look around, it's amazing how many uh, systems we use each day. And in fact, that's a big reason why right now is the easiest time ever for most industries to start a company because you have all these tools. Like for me, I don't have to know a ton about accounting. I can use QuickBooks, right? Or I don't need to know a bunch about uh, image processing. I can just use Photoshop. There's so many tools that really help accelerate. So technology and systems leverage. Communication marketing, basically the ability to use social media tools, to use these platforms to, to reach a broad audience. I mean, I mean, for me yesterday, writing my first blog post, and being able to reach, I mean, just off the analytics, uh, like, you know, 500 people reading this uh, on LinkedIn and Medium. I mean, that's incredible, right? I mean, 500 people taking the time to, to read this article that was written. Um, and I mean, could you imagine back in the day when you had to print out paper and give to people, you know, I mean, trying to get the distribution and the cost and the time associated with that would have been incredible. So communications and marketing leverage is, is huge. Uh, networking relationship. Pretty straightforward, the larger your network, the more powerful. This is honestly, in my opinion, one of the biggest ones here, um, but you guys all understand it pretty intuitively, so I won't go into it. And then knowledge and experience. So this is the, like, the big one I benefited through going through this course. And what I'm trying to help you guys and you know, future blog posts and stuff with is this knowledge piece, right? And like knowing the, the right way to approach things. So for example, investing in you know, assets that return a much better return or even, instead of working 40 years and saving into a 401k, working 10 years and, and saving into real estate investment. I mean, and again, I'm just making up this example, but I mean, having the knowledge to make that decision is huge, right? I mean, absolutely huge. It could greatly accelerate your, your, your end goals. Um, so paying attention to that knowledge and experience leverage by reading books, by um, getting experience, you know, like with different skill sets and different business processes is huge. And that's something that I'm really starting to learn myself. All right, switching gears here, risk management and diversification. So this is the exciting stuff. Uh, most people hate this stuff, but it's, it's actually really interesting if you're kind of a systems nerd like me. So I've already talked about systematic risk versus security specific risk, but because it's a complicated uh, subject, I'll, I'll kind of brief on it a little bit more. So again, security specific, it's one, uh, so like what if Apple goes down, right? Or what if Facebook goes down? Like how does that affect my portfolio? 
Well, if you're invested in the like an S&P 500 index fund, for example, then there are you know 500 other com- or 499 other companies in that fund. So that one going down is barely going to make a dent in the overall return of that portfolio. But that same portfolio would be very uh, in risk of systematic risks, right? So what that would mean is like the U.S. stock market, or there would be a, a credit collapse and this U.S. stock market collapsing because of that. I mean, that affects all of the stocks in the S&P 500 pretty uniformly if you look at you know, any of the other previous market crashes. So those two ideas, when you look at your portfolio, so again, all the assets that you own from a holistic standpoint, that's really important to kind of think about uh, those two differences, right? So from a, okay, so for, exa- for example, the passive long-term buy and hold index fund uh, recommendation I gave essentially takes care of the security specific risk for that portfolio. But in order to accommodate the uh, systematic risk, you need to have uh, uh, like different uh, pillars, if you will, to your portfolio. So maybe some real estate investment in the Puget Sound, maybe some real estate investment in uh, you know, somewhere in Wisconsin, uh, maybe like a little business that you run that has you know, like $2,000 a month that it generates. And that starts to kind of diversify where if the market crashes, your real estate investing might go down a little bit, but might not, right? If, if you, as long as you bought it well, it probably will be just fine and continue to give you about the same amount of cash flow. Um, in your business, you know, maybe it takes a little bit of a hit because there's less money in the economy, but it's still producing that, you know, let's say 1800 a month. Um, so even though your stock portfolio has like essentially gone in half, you still have a lot of cash coming from these other areas. So that's kind of the idea with diversification and really thinking about a holistic approach to it. Um, okay, and then the last point here is to really bake into your plan uh, essentially several layers of, of your plan, right? So what does this look like? So for me specifically, this looks like, okay, me building a consulting agency, right? That hopefully I can build into a, a, a software SaaS or like a, a, a software product that produces uh, like a couple or like X amount of cash flow per month. Um, but even if it can't do that, uh, I've got a great backup plan in the sense of I could go to some big company and say like, hey, you know, I'm a software engineer, I've done this. I just spent the last, you know, six months doing like building this company, which would set me up really well for a property or a, a product manager role, right? So I've kind of got that, that plan B where I'm still not directly working towards it, but I'm, I'm still building up experience that if this business fails, I could bring over to the product manager role. Um, in addition to all this, um, I'm also educating myself on real estate investing and paper asset investing so that when I do have the money to, or the, in the time to invest into those assets, like after my business is up and running and hits the goals I wanted to hit, then I can actually go ahead and invest fully into those and, and know a lot more of what I'm doing. So if you kind of see like, I'm not just going down one path, I'm actually going down multiple paths at the same time and kind of like strategically position myself to where I'm building the skill set and I'm, I'm building the knowledge base and the relationships and basically all those leverage points, right? Like I'm building all those assets in a way that is one, redundant, so that again, if my business fails, I've got a backup career. And also that helps accelerate my wealth plan. So while I'm generating the money and, and building the business, which will lead to uh, business products that I can build later, I'm also building up that knowledge in uh, investing in paper assets and real estate. So it's kind of you know like you're killing multiple birds with one stone, so to speak. So just one thing I wanna put in there, but that's a really uh, strategic and I think interesting way to incorporate risk management into your plan. All right, any questions on any of that? Maybe Justin and the chat has some. Yeah, let's go to our live viewers here. Uh, it doesn't look like there are any questions coming in, actually. Uh, oh, well, perfect. You guys must be following right along, so that's uh, that's great. <laughs> actually, I have one. Would you consider your primary residence to be savings, like your mortgage payment? On That's a great question. So uh, just to repeat the question for our, our live audience here. Um, yeah, so the question was regarding like your primary residency, assuming that you've purchased it, uh, is that savings or not? A lot of people go back and forth. Um, kind of the rule of thumb is, or I, I'd say what most people say is, like, you're always going to need a place to live, right? So there's never going to be a time that you're probably going to sell that house and like be able to use that money somewhere, right? Yeah, like, even in retirement, unless you go to a retirement home, in which case you're probably, you know, toward, towards the very end of your life and thus, like, it's not super relevant. It doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> so like unless you're at that point, then you're always going to have that money tied up in some sort of house, 
right? So essentially, it's I wouldn't necessarily call it savings. I would I would say like exclude that from your your net worth, but technically it is a part of your net worth, right? Um, but I think why people say that is the only time it's really relevant is when you look at how much money you're going to be given to the next generation, right? Because you're never practically really going to be able to sell that house and use that money for something. And again, unless you've got like a short time horizon. So when you life. calculate your monthly mortgage payment, do you count that as spend? That's a good question. Yeah. So your entire monthly mortgage payment should be counted as uh, spending. Oh. Wow. Uh, because it's it's essentially spending down a resource that. Um, is, is a lifestyle expense when, when it comes down to Even it. Even though it's, imp- it's now, Again, mathematically, more. this is not true, right? Mathematically, yeah. you're paying whatever, 70% at the beginning towards uh, interest and then t- 30% towards principal. That 30% is technically savings, but from a practical standpoint, in terms of like, when are you gonna sell your house and be able to use that money, right? Like if you do sell your house, it's probably gonna go to buy another house that you're gonna live in. Um, so from a practical standpoint, it's best to just think about that as, as spending. Uh, and then just kind of exclude it so that you build, I mean, you, you might get additional money. Let's say you, um, you know, have five kids and then uh, sell that house and downsize to a smaller place. Like you'll probably get additional money from that, but, but who knows if you're actually gonna have five kids or have a house big enough that you want to downsize from. So it's kind of like, you don't really know, so it's best to just pencil that in as expenditures. We have, well, the screen's dark, but we also have a question from our viewer. Um, yeah. Systemic risk versus security specific risk. Do you hold a specific position on specific securities? Or is your paper asset all hedged against systemic risk? So my paper assets are exposed to systemic risk, right? So for me specifically, I've got like a broad market fund that basically holds, like it it really represents the US market plus some international markets, right? So it's very susceptible to systemic risk. Now there are some active paper asset strategies, which are very complicated and basically what hedge fund managers do, right? Mm-hmm. To, to help mitigate that systemic risk. But for me, I just accept it, right? I'm like security specific risk is easy to, is easy to solve because you just get a bunch of stocks and then the security specific risk is, is so small that it doesn't really matter, right? Mm-hmm. But systemic risk is really difficult to hedge against with paper assets. So for me, I just accept it but I mitigate it when you take a step back and look at the holistic plan, right? Because the real estate investing and the business asset class, which I, I have, or I don't have the real estate investing side, but I've got the business asset class. Those help mitigate against, or like, like they have different risk profiles, right? So if, if the stock market crashes, my, my business pro- or like probably won't crash. So in, in that sense, I do uh, mitigate the systemic risk, but I don't do it directly in my portfolio, if that makes sense. So, and again, I mean, I, I spent like two years going through this course, learning all this stuff, right? So like, <laughs> there's a lot of math and a lot of context behind all this. So I do apologize if it's so, helpful. So Justin asks, to be clear, do you specifically hold <clears throat> specific securities, i.e. do you have a lot of Amazon? It, oh, I, I see. Never mind, I hear that. Actually, that's a great question. Uh, so I'll, I'll touch on this really quickly. How much Amazon do you have? I. <laughs> Five percent of my portfolio is uh, is 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 stuff that I can speculate in individual securities, right? right? So this would be like Amazon, Bitcoin. Uh, I mean, just anything that's like kind of speculative, right? Like I stick to the tried and true, like I mean, lots of research backed in that path, except for that last five percent, and that's kind of my fun money to like invest in random stuff that I think is going to do well. So in that case, I limit that security specific risk by one having the majority of my money in one that already has it eliminated, mm-hmm. and two, uh, by limiting my s- uh, specific you know, uh, security investments to just a small 5% pool. Mm-hmm. So if all those get wiped out, I'm only down 5% out of my yeah. entire portfolio. Cool. All right, now the exciting time, guys, my wealth plan. Uh, for the record, these are my actual like notes. Yeah. Uh, I've got a, a, a beautiful moleskin notebook, which my designer friend design would appreciate. Uh, filled with notes uh, and insights. So these are all the big like, oh my gosh, aha moments going through this course. Um, yeah, and, and don't take any photos, please. Just show me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's that. Um, okay, so I will give you guys my official goal summary and then walk through kind of the action steps and the emotional goal as to why. So as I mentioned briefly, the goal here is to go from consulting work, right? So essentially working for companies uh, building software, websites, you know, different tools, to, you know, going, okay, take a step back. So the consulting side uh, benefits me in a number of ways. 
So I, you know, I spent the last number of years down in SF learning how to be a good engineer, right? Obviously there's a, a huge ways I could go to improve, but for the most part, my engineering skills are at a spot where I'm, I'm happy with them. But <laughs> I have next to no experience marketing or selling or doing all these other skills that are equally as large a part of the business, right? As the actual engineering side. So that's where the consulting has been really helpful because I can step in and de-risk those parts of my experience and my skill set by you know trying to sell and trying to market and fumbling through it like I have the last couple months, but learning a lot and really you know, starting to gain traction, um, and kind of de-risk it before I get to a more challenging but more prosperous business model, which is SaaS. Right? Consulting is is pretty simple because I mean you're trading your time for your money, and with a bit of a resume, I mean it shouldn't be too hard to go out there and to sell people on like yeah you should hire me to build your website, right? So the idea is this is a little bit easier to generate, but it also forces me to learn that, those hard skills. At the same time, one of the hardest things I found down in San Francisco was coming up with an idea, right? Like it sounds silly. Like, I mean, you, you come up with ideas all day long, but coming up with one that fits all of the like, you know, 80 check boxes in my head, it was tough. I mean, so tough that I was like, I, I just can't do it. On top of that, uh, I think of myself as a disciplined person, but the reality is I could not find enough time to work on these, these businesses, right? Or at least like I didn't see as much uh, momentum as I wanted to, but I still somehow was able to find the time to watch six seasons of Game of Thrones in the course of three weeks. <laughs> so clearly, you know, uh, I, I think my, my theory here is that as a, uh, especially a software engineer, but as a creative individual, uh, just being in that mindset, right? And like going through an entire day's worth of work where you're you know, cognitively like really taxed that you just don't have energy or like this is really the mental capacity or the discipline when you get home from that to, you know, to keep working on side projects, at least for me, everybody's different, but for me, that was the case. So that's why consulting is great is it allows me to more directly get to that. In addition to, uh, if you think about what I do, right? Like I, I work with small businesses that are paying like tens of thousands of dollars to solve a problem, right? So like clearly that problem is big, <laughs> otherwise they would not be willing to trade money for it. Um, so by looking at these businesses and seeing what problems they have, I mean, that's the best way to find SaaS or software as a service or software product ideas, right? Is to figure out these core problems and the, you know, go to one real estate company and then see this and then go find some other ones like them and like, oh my gosh, all these companies have a very similar problem. Maybe there's a similar code base I could develop that would apply to all of them, right? So this kind of idea of kickstarting my ideation at the same time as building cash and de-risking some of my other um, you know, components of, of, of the SaaS business uh, is what all this is about. Now, the exciting part is once I get a SaaS product up and running, right? So, and maybe generating, I don't know, 10,000 a month or whatever. I mean, I, I just pull that number out of thin air, right? But I can take that cash and basically use that cash to pay for a real estate investment, right? To pay the monthly mortgage or whatever it might be. I'd like to save up the money that I can use as a down payment for real estate. So the beautiful thing with SaaS is, I, because it's a business asset, I can hypothetically, if I build it right, build it really fast and to generate a lot of money, right? But just the nature of software as a service, um, even though it's, it's, it's very efficient in a lot of ways, it doesn't usually have more than like a five or 10 year shelf life, right? Like I can't expect to put some software up and 10 years later be making the same amount of money without much work. So that's where real estate investing is very different, right? Real estate investing is is one of the, is arguably the best asset long term to grow wealth. So generating the wealth is better done through SaaS, but preserving the wealth and keeping it in a format, aka monthly cash flow, that works well in retirement is much better suited for real estate investing. So learn the skills, get the uh, 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 initial money, make the initial connections. Uh, use those connections, money, and skills to develop a bunch of wealth, ideally, or a bunch of cash, uh, cash flow, and then translate that into uh, an asset that will preserve that, and that will uh, keep that in a reliable format, so that if I have a family, or if I want to spend time doing something else, I've got that saving, and like work in the background for me. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a lot of kind of the high level strategy of my wealth plan and, and what I'm up to now. And you'll notice I've been going through this, like I mentioned, for the last like year and a half, two years. So I'm already taking action with this wealth plan, right? I mean, the fact that I moved back up here earlier than I would have otherwise to start this business is like my first step, big step towards this. Um, so my specific goal is by my 30th birthday, I'm like 23 and a half right now, uh, I will have $8,000 a month 
or more of semi-passive income. So semi-passive means I might spend a couple months or a couple hours a month working on it. Um, net of taxes, so that's, again, that's after tax, flowing into my checking account from residential real estate investments. So again, having already gone through like both of these steps and gone through the real estate investing side. Um, using my ability to create cash flow generating software products to fund the real estate investment acquisition, which I just explained. I will spend less than 10 hours per month managing these assets, allowing me total control of my day to day and the ability to fully pursue my family, volunteering and other business and investment dreams. And that last part there is my why, right? Like that's why I'm really passionate about achieving this. So yeah. So, so 10 hours per month managing the assets that are generating $8,000 uh, a month, you must have a property manager then or something. Correct. Yeah. So this would be assuming property management in place or systems that I develop that mitigate the, the time. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And that's, that's why I put the time requirement in there is to make sure that I, uh, I build the real estate investment in a way that's adheres to the, like the low commitment. Cause so, oh, sorry, not, not you. yeah, well, uh, yeah. I mean, I'll also say, you know, after countless hundreds of hours, you know, investing in my, uh, uh wealth plan, I've got this beautiful little paragraph to, to show for it. <laughs> So, so you said you want to have a, a SaaS product that will last five to ten years. Um, Justin is asking, can you explain more about how many hours or weeks you think it, to make, it takes to maintain that, basically? Like, okay. Maintain the relevancy. Well, it's ten of. per month. And uh, true, true. Justin's got one more question, then he's got to be in, in, in the office in order to ask more. <laughs> sure. um, okay. You can actually send five dollars uh, <laughs> to Patrick, and he'll be able to ask one more. <laughs> So, um, sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> it was like, okay, so he says, a five to 10 year shelf life for making passive income on SaaS seems pretty long. It seems like you need a good amount of time to keep the product relevant, marketing, okay. acquire users, et cetera. That's a great question. So, I mean, even a five to 10 year time horizon seems long for SaaS. Yeah. So, um, yes, so uh, this time goal, the 10 hours per month, is strictly for the passive income, right? So like, I plan to continue to be very active and essentially devote my full time to building these SaaS apps. So uh, I guess I, I give the time, ten to t uh, five to ten year time horizon to as an example of like potentially I could build a SaaS app that could sustain itself for that long, right? But realistically, it's probably going to take more time than that, which is why I, I need the real estate piece of this and why I'm not just stopping at SaaS uh, as my passive income. Mm -hmm. So I guess I, I agree with them. I think that it obviously depends on the kind of business and a lot of specifics. But that's that's where this this piece comes in is to take care of that uh, um, need to you know be really active in SaaS. So the ten hours a month is for the real estate. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and and again, that's you know sourcing new real estate deals, that's managing uh, properties. Which once you have a few up and running, or if you have a large apartment building that has on site property management, mm -hmm. uh, I mean that's I think that's realistic. Um, you know, one thing to note too, uh, uh, Todd, who is the um, the guy that I've learned a lot of this stuff from, right? He uh, built a hedge fund when, uh, actually, first off, he was making, in his 20s, he was, and this is back in like the 90s, he was making, or 80s, uh, uh, over, uh, I think, 200 or $300,000. I mean, just incredible amount of wealth and living off of about 20% of it. Um, so he was able to save a huge amount. And then he started a hedge fund and built that up and was one of the first quantitative investors on Wall Street and ended up selling that hedge fund when he was 35. Um, and then took a couple of years off just traveling the world and doing all that good stuff. And then was a professional coach for the last 20 years. So he's about, I think, 56 or 57 now. Mm -hmm. um, and he, like, so I've talked to him a couple of times and we actually talked on the phone going through this entire wealth plan for about an hour and a half. And I've got the recording, uh, which um, I'd, I'd be willing to share with select people. <laughs> um, uh, but going through all this. So he, like, he helped kind of revise a little bit of this and shortcut some of it. But a lot of this, I mean, all of it has been kind of like, like stamped by him, mm -hmm. you know, and he, I mean, he's not God, like he doesn't know everything, but he's a really smart guy that again, I learned a lot of this from and has built this entire course with thousands of people going through it. So, um, just, I mean, some context to that, uh, hopefully that gives some credibility to kind of the engineering behind it as well. Cool. All right. So the emotional goal is a big part of this as well. So I, I wanted to include it and there's like a second part of this. So, um, oh, you know what? Okay. These are backwards, but that's okay. So uh, I have a very high value on freedom and personal growth, specifically in kind of this order, family, local volunteering and youth mentorship through the church, practical education and skill development. So kind of like learning this wealth stuff, um, building 
And I, I just like generally love building, whether it's like dirt bike engines or organizations or businesses or real estate. Like I just love the practice of kind of like understanding the system and bringing it into life. Um, and then five, day-to-day freedom and financial security. So, you know, the sleep all day or play Xbox or more realistically, like just go to the gym in the middle of the day, whatever I want to do, having the freedom to do that is, is a high value to me. Um, and then the emotional goal is twofold here. Uh, being in a financial position to pursue priorities and opportunities in the five categories listed above. Um, being So, yeah, these five. And then being in full control of my day-to-day work. And then building the skill set, beginning to become the person I want to be in order to achieve my wealth goal. So basically what I'm seeing here is the skill sets I need to develop, right? The ability to uh, build relationships, to uh, lead, to uh, get presentations like this, to market, to like the person I need to become to be able to accomplish all this, right? And to to be able to build this funnel up here. Uh, That is something that like, those skill sets translate directly into, again, my, my life mission, right? To systematically empower young leaders and to be able to give them that toolkit, right? And to be able to kind of, uh, you know, be the father and like the family guy I want to be. So all of this, this, this whole process is not only achieving the, the means to an end of generating the wealth I need to do my why, but the way that I'm doing it and the skill sets that I'm forced to, to grow in and the experiences I'm forced to have while I'm doing it is directly growing me in the ways that I want to grow, right? Like, and this was something I really wrestled with when I was a software engineer, is I, I felt like I was using maybe 30% of my capability. Not saying that I'm like some brilliant guy that could you know, do a lot better programming, but in the fact that like, there were all these skill sets that I wanted, or all these you know, experiences that I wanted to have that I wasn't having day to day. And for me to really look at my day to day, right? And to see what I'm doing, and to, and to push myself into a, a spot where I am growing, in those those ways was really important. So that's part of the emotional piece of this as well, is again, making sure that when I look 10 years from now, that those years were spent building up skill sets that I care about and making me become the person I want I want to be. So that's a, a big piece of the emotional goal as well. Um, kind of touching on that last point, uh, before quitting my job, I was also very motivated by moving away from the day-to-day structure and environment. So those other two were kind of moving to goals and this was like a moving away from goal. Um, again, limiting my capacity to like 30% of what I'm capable of. Um, and that was also pretty stress and anxiety inducing. Um, but that's much less of an issue now because I've already uh, taken that first step towards optimizing my day-to-day by building this company uh, to toggle. So yeah, so that's my goal. Um, I'll go through quickly kind of the steps. I won't like detail everything here, but I've got a couple, I think five steps here. So May of this year, July of 2020, which is what, two and a half years or one and a half years away. July or January of 2021, um, June of 2025, which I believe is, yeah. So that would be my 30th birthday. So you can see, you know, I've broken this down into like very actionable steps. So um, the first piece is, uh, okay. So like right now, what is my goal? My goal by May is to generate $26,500 in gross revenue uh, through my business. And the reason I, or I came to that number by uh, my living expenses, which are roughly $4,800 per month that I need to generate in order to cover my $3,000 a month living expenses plus tax, plus uh, fully funding my Roth IRA for this year, for my toxic account. So that's where this number came from. I wanna get up to that, and that also replenishes some of my, state, of my emergency fund. And then uh, from there on, I'm gonna work uh, to generate $4,800 per month so that's roughly like five days of billable work plus a couple days of you know uh, marketing and other uh, things, and then so take about a week a month out of my time to invest in the business, and then take the other three weeks out of a month and use that to build these SaaS products, right? So the the idea is instead of so like like go full on with the consulting until I get the twenty six and a half k, and then slow the consulting down or just kind of keep it steady and focus my extra time and energy on building these SaaS products so that I can kind of use my consulting as just, you know, again, that generating of cash and then keep trying and keep trying at these SaaS products until something works. So this is a goal to kind of like shortcut into finding those SaaS products instead of saving a ton of money first and taking years to do that and then going after it. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Um, So yeah, this details a lot of that. And then, um, yeah, I, I won't go into detail here. You guys are welcome to look at it if you're interested but that kind of details that first part of it. And then 
Uh, one thing I'll mention too, this is a really cool strategy, this idea of house hacking. So the, the idea here is you could buy, so with a residential loan, right, which is four units or less. Um, so you need commercial loans, which have uh, a lot of disadvantages. If you have five units or more, so like an apartment building with five units, you need a commercial loan for. But if it's four or less, it's considered residential. And why that matters is you get a lot of advantages in terms of tax and advantages in terms of the loans you can get. Um, again, without going into detail, but there's a lot of advantage here. So for me, I can go and buy a fourplex, so a, a house in four units. So if, for example, in the Puget Sound region, like Port Orchard or Bremerton would be a great spot for this, I think. Um, and then live in one of them and rent out the other three. And essentially, if I buy it right, have those other three pay for all the expenses so that I'm either living for free or maybe even make a little bit of money off of this. At the same time, I'm getting those five benefits that I listed later for real estate. And I'm just like automatically making money. And the crazy part is, if you do this four times, I mean, you, you basically just landed your retirement. And you can get an FHA loan. Uh, well, again, the numbers on this are change year to year. But for a property of up to, I think, $650,000, which in those regions I mentioned are, are realistic, um, and then you only have to pay 3.5% down. So, and, and again, like this is one financing strategy. There are uh, downsides here. But that ability to go out, pay 3.5% down, I mean, 3.5% of even a 600K property is fairly reasonable, especially compared to a 20% down loan, right? So you can kind of quickly get into this, live in one of those units, have the other three paying for you to live there. So that wipes out your biggest expense, right? That 33% of your, you know, a normal person's uh, income that goes to living is just gone. And then in addition, you get all the tax and other benefits. So that's a really amazing way to go. And that's my goal is, uh, by January 2021 to have my first real estate investment that is a house hack, um, probably in Port Orchard or Bremerton. Uh, and then, you know, continuing to build that up and kind of snowball that. There's a, a lot of other cool strategies, which I won't go into here, uh, about how to accelerate your real estate, but to use the SaaS and then also to use the money I'm starting to make from real estate investments to continue to buy more of them. Kind of like Monopoly, right? Like getting more and more of the little hotels. Um, so yeah, so that's my, my goal there. Um, any thoughts or questions on the wealth plan? I have a question. Uh, how does, what are, because you said you want to get, be married by 30. What do you expect your partner to make? There, there are two pieces here. One, it's an unknown, mm -hmm. right? I, I mean, obviously, like, I mean, who knows if I could even get married anywhere near 30, right? Sure. Like, that, so that's an unknown, let alone how much they were going to make. Mm -hmm. And then two, uh, whether, you know, uh, she or myself or both of us would want to stay home with the kids. Or if we can even have kids, right? I mean, like so many unknowns here. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I just plan to like have like not account for that income, mm -hmm. right? And the other thing is, I mean, maybe uh, she has a large income, but also has a ton of student debt, right? Or I mean, there's so many variables here that just like you gotta pay every day, you know. Just not accounting for that um, income is, I think, the, the more risk prudent way to, to go about it, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. or kind of the you know the more accurate. So, so if you can put a 3.5% loan on a fourplex that generates positive cash flow, theoretically all you need is that 3% 3, 3 loan, right? So like, I don't know how much money that is, but let's say like 20K. Why don't you just buy that like this year? Like why don't you just screw all your IRAs and 401Ks and all that? Why don't you just, why don't you just do that? That's a really good question. I'm glad you asked that. Yeah. That comes down to opportunistic focus and it comes down to the fact that, which I'll explain in a sec, and it comes down to the fact that um, I can't go back in time and contribute to my Roth, right? Like once I miss the like the year window to contribute, like that that potential is gone, mm -hmm. right? Like like if I didn't contribute for twenty seventeen, I can never go back and contribute for that year. Mm -hmm. um, like once once April eighteenth or whenever you file your taxes goes by, uh, then that, that opportunity is gone. So in short, that's why. And why I care about that is because I want to have those three legs to my wealth portfolio mm -hmm. for a risk diverse or uh, for a diversification and risk management perspective, right? Like I, I, I don't want to be just real estate mm -hmm. or just business. I want to have real estate business and paper assets. So what I'm doing is I'm prematurely adding up my real estate or my uh, paper assets, right? Sooner than I normally would mm -hmm. so that I can switch over to real estate and focus fully in there and not have to worry about making up for lost time with my paper assets, if that kind of makes sense. Sure, yeah, it's just that like the markets are getting, growing so quickly, it almost seems like you're missing out. Yeah. Like to me, right, whereas like paper assets will always be the same. You can always contribute to Roth IRA and um, growth. Yeah, I mean obviously there's a ton of nuance in, in yeah. what you just said there, but I, I mean I, I would say that it, it's, 
it, it, it's like like it's so close that you could make a case either way. Okay. okay. Right. Like the reason I'm doing it is more for risk management uh, purposes. Cool. And the fact that for me, like I want to focus all my time and energy, that opportunistic focus. So actually, to explain this, opportunistic focus is really powerful as a mental like framework. The idea is what. So there are a bunch of opportunities out there. Right. So like I might want to invest in real estate and I might want to build a business. But right now, given the market conditions, given where I'm at in life, given the amount of uh, liquid cash I have on hand, what makes the most sense? For me, it's to build this business, right? And, and, and like, you know, given all the engineering experience I just had and the fact that I've researched a lot about real estate, but I haven't actually invested, mm -hmm. and that I've got, you know, a lot of money potentially tied up in this business over the next couple of years. Um, it makes a lot of sense for me to focus on that. Like, that's where the opportunity is, right? So I'm gonna focus there. now let's say we go through a market crash in a year or two, right? And then the, uh, uh, the real estate markets take about a year or two to rebound after that. So maybe three or four years from now, when I've been building up this business and have this pile of cash that I've been investing in different things, that's an incredible time to switch over to investing in real estate, mm -hmm. right? So I'm kind of doing it like one step at a time. So like when I enter, when as soon as I turned 18, I started funding my Roth IRA, right? And I started building up my paper asset portfolio. So that I, I, I'm, I'm happy with where it's at now. And in fact, it's much, uh, larger than my uh, business or, or real estate. So um, I'm switching gears kind of over, I mean, I'm continuing this, but switching gears over to the business. And then once I kind of get that built up and the market conditions change to where there's tons of great real estate deals out there, which isn't the case right now, at least in the Puget Sound market, um, then I can switch over to real estate and start to deploy a bunch of assets into that and kind of build it up. So then I've got this kind of three column plan, if that makes sense. So that's just one kind of mental framework for thinking about how to focus your time and energy. We have a question coming in from someone named Justin It. Weird last name. Um, and he says, how does he, Patrick, balance that with where he wants to live? I.e., he moved from Gig Harbor to Seattle because he wants to live in Seattle, even though he's paying rent instead of saving money by staying at his parents. I, too, he's now talking about himself, struggle with the idea of living in one of the fourplex units my parents own if it's not in... He didn't say my parents. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that's what he's talking about, right? No, he's talking about if... Oh, he's, he's talking about living in his own fourplex. I'm yes. sorry. I struggle with living in a fourplex if it's not in the area I would want to live. So For instance, that, he doesn't want to go live in frickin' Port Angeles. That, that, that's, that's a, <laughs> <laughs> I think is what he's saying. He doesn't want to live in Port Angeles. How do you... That, that, that's a really great point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And basically what his question is, just to repeat it really quick, is uh, how do you reconcile uh, cost of living and the house hacking or like owning a fourplex idea with where you're actually living? Um, and with you know big, uh, especially like coastal cities, it's really tough, right? Because you can't, when I mean, you're not in, uh, even like Austin, Texas, where you can get reasonable properties that are not too far out of town. Um, so how, how do you reconcile that? One, um, he mentioned kind of me moving from uh, like the first month when I was back home before I came out to Seattle. Um, and like, like how to reconcile that. That one was, I think, pretty easy. I mean, I mean one, just the, the, like the business development opportunities in Seattle are really strong, right? Without going into too much detail, the time I would spend commuting and then time I would, uh, or the events I would miss out on and not be able to partake in, such as stuff like this, uh, the opportunity cost was so big that I, I could fairly easily make a case for the extra money to you know, live up here. Um, in terms of what he was talking about in terms of like, where do you live? I mean, yeah, that's tough. I, I would argue that there still are some opportunities. Uh, so just to give a specific example, uh, you know, buying a place in Bremerton or Port Orchard and taking the 28 minute foot ferry from over there into the core downtown of the ferry terminals mm -hmm. is not a, not a bad way to go. Those ferries are, 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 are pretty beautiful. So it, it does kind of come down to like, a, how quickly, you know, do you want to shave a couple of years off of your wealth plan or maybe a year? Uh, or do you want to like have a little bit more lifestyle? Which you know, if your well plan is going to get you to financial independence in ten years, it might very well be worth taking an extra couple of years to you know maybe not accelerate it quite as fast. So it's really a personal decision, but um, uh, I, I'd say that there are a lot of creative ways to kind of you know not just rule it out. Yeah. You could move to Wyoming and live in a fourplex there. And All right. <laughs> so my biggest insights here. Um, I will go through this really quick. This, I, I do apologize, is like a wall of text, uh, but these are kind of like all the like amazing little nuances or little ideas that kind of sparked uh, when I was going through this and when I was reading through my notebook. So hopefully this will be inspirational to you guys. And I am happy to say that this is the last like me talking slide <laughs> or set of slides. 
Um, and then it goes to just resources for you guys, which uh, we just breeze through. So first bet here, it's a lot easier to hit financial independence than I had thought. Like going through this, and I mean, hopefully you guys kind of are feeling that already, like kind of starting to see more options and kind of starting to see a little bit of the math behind it. But it's it's actually like, I mean, I, I, I you know, there are a lot of situations where this isn't the case, but it's actually not that difficult to hit, fin uh, hit financial independence within 10 years, given the principles here. And again, assuming normal market conditions over the next 10 years. Not saying that, you know, people are dumb that don't do it, but just that, like, if you understand all the fundamentals here, like, it, the math is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's shocking how many people don't, or never really think about what they're devoting the majority of their working hours to. I mean, I, I find this crazy, right? Most waste over half of their life chasing goals that they don't actually want. Like, a lot of material goals that they might not even want. The default 40 or 9 to 5 path is very inefficient. Not to say that it's bad. Right? Again, people might love their careers and really enjoy going through that, but it is very inefficient from a wealth generation standpoint. And if your goal is not your career, then I would argue you should really consider kind of what's being talked about here and maybe think about alternative paths. And again, that's where that knowledge comes in, right? Like if you don't have the background on investing or kind of this well planned stuff, like you just wouldn't even, you know, like see this. Um, so you guys are making a great step forward. Um, Figuring out the stuff when you're young is shocking. Is shockingly huge advantage, for obvious reasons. I mean, it's just we're so fortunate <laughs> to be able to to find this stuff early on and be able to take action now when we have the time. And like, I mean, for me, I can I can waste seven years of my life and still be in a fine spot, right? Like, I I mean, we're just we're fortunate to have that. Um, it's all about building cash flow streams. Uh, unless you have less than 30 years to live, at which point cash flow is still a a, a preferred asset or, or a preferred structure of wealth versus uh, assets. Live your ideal life now. Saving and waiting for when is a fallacy. We should, uh, this is shown by what most experience when they hit financial independence. Retirement is not a vacation. It sucks unless you have meaning and fulfillment in your life. Through community, through work, through other means. It's really interesting. Going through this course, one of the pieces of it is each of the like, I don't know, 60 lessons has an hour long phone call associated with it. Where Todd walks with different students through the course. Right, and most of these students are kind of in their like 40s to like 60s. Um, a couple of younger guys. One of the most interesting things is hearing how everybody has kind of the same reaction when they hit financial independence, where it's like they've lost meaning in their life, right? And they and, and like like Todd got pretty depressed after the, his like vacation, and it took him a couple of years to really figure out what he wanted to do because I mean you go from living this life that you know I mean you've got like a goal and you've got purpose and you've got you know community in, in your day to day job to having all that stripped away and you're completely free and there's no responsibility to like go out and do anything right so you kind of have to like structure that yourself so all this to say that I mean one that was really insightful to like hear these people's like uh, essentially going into retirement and like experiencing that but two like. It, like there's not like a switch that happens, right? You don't go from like working to like, oh, okay, you know, retirement, golden years, I mean, we're just kicking back and having fun. Like the way that it should be done is building that in now, right? And figuring out that community piece now. So for me, um, I get a lot of value in mentoring um, and really, again, helping kind of develop those younger leaders. Uh, so for me, like doing that now, right? Like while I'm in this development stage and really building that community and building that experience, like, I don't see my life changing that much after I hit financial independence, right? I mean, like, my time will shift from primarily building a, a company to generate wealth to, you know, building some sort of, I don't know, software product to help young leaders, right? Or maybe, like, doing more volunteering work and stuff. But it's not like it's completely going to change. And I think that that is – so Todd has this term, the new retirement, and that's kind of this idea, right? Is it's like not waiting to do what you want to do, but figuring out that probably much lower than you think it's going to be wealth number. And then starting to like work towards that while you're living the life that you want to live. And it's like, I mean, it's, it's crazy. Like it's, I mean, I've, I've, I've had so much fun <laughs> over the last four months. And I'm so much happier than I was. I mean, so much happier than I was down in that stuff. Um, and I think this is a big piece of it. But it wasn't until I heard those people and the fact that like retirement's not a vacation, that like you still have to do stuff and be fulfilled, that it really kind of clicked with me that, you know, making this step and again, focusing on my day to day and what that looks like, right? Like how much am I volunteering? How much am I uh, talking to people I care about? And, and, you know, all these different pieces. So important piece to kind of keep in mind. All right, 95% of advisors are truly salespeople with a misaligned incentives giving bad advice. <laughs> 
So this is a pretty bold statement, but just uh, like on the surface level, if you think about you know somebody working at some financial institution that's selling you know financial products, uh, I mean clearly there there's some incentives to sell <laughs> those products that are maybe not in your best interest. Uh, so a lot of it's very heavy towards the financial base, um, and there are some products that like a two percent management fee ends up eating seventy five percent of your portfolio over thirty years, like, which is ludicrous. And if you look at the compounding math, like, and that seems crazy, but if you look at the compounding math, you'll see why. So just a, a, a word of caution, and there are some great resources out there for how to find good financial advisors, but taking the time to understand this stuff at a, a semi-deep level yourself is critical, because nobody else is going to be able to look out for you. And I know even uh, you know, with people I know personally that have you know, gone through this saving years and years and um, are doing fine financially, but could have been a lot better off if they would have uh, been able to learn some of this and avoid some of the bad managers earlier on. Um, one interesting thing is, I, this is kind of a truism I found, finding mentors through podcasts and books is perfectly valid, right? Like I, I always thought that, I mean, I, I do have obviously in-person mentors and advisors, which is really helpful, especially from a network standpoint. Since that's my mentor, Tim Ferriss. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of the biggest pieces of wisdom, I would say, well, not the biggest, but like some of the most impactful and some of the largest, like a lot of this wealth stuff comes from people, I mean, I've met Todd, uh, or I've talked to him three times, right? But, I mean, the vast majority of what I've learned from him has been essentially through audio and video content. So I wouldn't write off podcasts and books. Like, I, I truly have had very impactful, life-changing stuff happen to me through those mediums. So I feel like it's kind of discounted when people talk about mentors. Um, but that's just one thing I threw out there. Habits and their compounding effect are incredibly valuable. Would highly recommend uh, The One Thing and uh, The Power of Habits. Two great books on this. Um, your goals, think about them, think about who you'll need to become to achieve them and what you want to be. So kind of my, my preaching earlier about who I wanted to be and like kind of that day to day, that's what that touches to. All right, guys, I believe this is the last, oh, it is the last slide. Um, all right, paper assets are surprisingly risky relative to other classes. So, um, kind of actually jumping on to the second point, we will most likely experience a lot of change over the, over our lifetimes. Uh, and especially, uh, potentially, some fin rough financial times. Uh, we need to be prepared and to prudently manage our risk in our portfolios and our careers. Um, without going into too much detail, like at least according to Todd and other people I've, I've listened to, like the markets will probably be pretty flat and pretty volatile over the next 20 years, which is a really tough market to generate much wealth in just regarding paper assets. And again, nobody has a crystal ball, nobody knows like the future, but there are a lot of fundamentals with the monetary policy we have had, uh, the, the debt bubble that we're in right now, and a few other characteristics that point heavily to this, and, and the fact that our valuations are so high on, on mo in most paper assets. So just, again, a word of caution that like, I think we especially, our generation is gonna need to really pay attention to this and really be prudent. Um, the process of developing a wealth plan and understanding the why behind it gives you so much confidence, focus, and clarity. Like, I, I can't tell you guys how confident, I, I mean, you, you've probably seen it too, how confident I feel going into this next step, right? Like, I, I, I fundamentally believe that what I'm doing is the right path and that, you know, like, this is bringing me to those goals, which is amazing. And it's especially amazing when, you know, you uh, have difficulties through the business or through even just, like, the move back up here or whatever, like, it, it's just so reassuring to have so much confidence in the structure that I'm building. Um, and a lot of that clarity, and in fact, most of that clarity and confidence stems from the fact that I, I've taken the time to go through this. So that's, I mean, that's been a huge blessing for me uh, and something I'd recommend to you guys. And of course, that confidence uh, protrudes multiple areas of life, not just, um, you know, how I feel about business. And then uh, building wealth starts as soon as you start educating yourself. So this actually has multiple meanings, but what I was actually trying to say with it is uh, people think about like being an investor is like when you purchase a property, right? But it's actually not. It's when you start learning and it's when you start saving, right? Like as soon as you start to take those moves towards like, you know, learning how the investment world works, right? And starting to save a little bit more of your paycheck each month. I mean, those are the initial steps you're going to need to know how to invest and to actually have the cash to invest. Right? So like, I think kind of thinking of yourself as an investor now is a really powerful way to think about it, as opposed to, oh, you know, I, it's going to be years before I get to that point. It's like, no, no, I'm taking that on now and I'm you know, taking, making progress towards it now. So, cool. 
All right, so the last little bit here are just action items. So like stuff I recommend doing, and then uh, educational resources. So I just have kind of four categories for the educational resources, holistic investment and wealth strategy. So this is like the first stuff I'd basically recommend looking at for kind of the high level philosophy. Honestly, a lot of the stuff I talked about here. Uh, this is the course I learned all that, like almost everything I've told you guys today, like has been either reinforced or I've learned completely through this course. Um, it is a paid course, it's like 800 bucks right now. So, I mean, I'm not saying go out and buy it, but it, it, I mean, if, if, if you'd be willing to spend, you know, like 100 hours or maybe you're less than that, but like a significant amount of time going through this material, highly recommend it. He also has an incredible podcast and tons of free online content. So if you like reading blogs and going through podcasts and stuff, I, I mean, I would definitely take that stuff up first and see what you think. Um, great book and uh, Bigger Pockets has a, a podcast that also kind of touches into this. Um, uh, lowering expenses, saving resources, uh, real estate investing, again, books and podcasts that are great for that, uh, and including this course, which is probably the first thing I would do if I were you guys and you wanted to learn more about real estate investing. Um, and then producti productivity and optimizing your time, which are, you know, again, along with uh, saving more money, that's like the second biggest thing you can take action on now. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so in terms of actions items, again, you guys all have access to this PDF or in you know, the video. Um, I would recommend uh, this why exercise, which is this freestyle writing. So basically eight and a half by 11 pages, completing four of them. So four full pages of writing and like journaling basically for each of these three questions. And this is, it was kind of a, a little bit of a painful exercise for me to go through. Just, I mean, literally my hand got tired. <laughs> um, but it was amazing the amount of clarity. And there's some research behind this, but basically by forcing yourself to complete four pages, you just like completely empty your mind of a lot of the like kind of clutter and, and just noise. And you get to like the true like nuggets of, of insights that are actually like, again, kind of shocking when you actually see them written down uh, that you kind of have to go through that initial like two to three pages before you actually get to those like real nuggets. And especially for like, ambiguous, you know, broad, kind of hazy goals like your why, this is a really powerful exercise, especially when you go to these three questions. And I pulled this exercise directly from the course. So this is like probably the most pivotal moment for me in terms of my why going through the course. Um, so again, you guys have access to the slides, but I, would, I highly recommend taking the time. I mean, it's about 40 minutes or so, you know, to go through like one of these questions or, well, it depends on how fast you write, but I would highly recommend that. And then uh, on the next slide here. What was your answer to the last question? Oh, that's a good question, Sarah. Oops. All right. Imagine this is your last year of life. What is one big thing you want to accomplish? Uh, what accomplishment, no matter how crazy, have made it that you're worth living? <laughs> that's well, a tough really question. Not to put you on the spot. Heart right here. <laughs> that's a, I mean, that's a pretty life. deep. That's God. like about as deep of a question as you can ask. Um, I think, <laughs> I think for me, um, I don't know. I mean, I mean, the initial thing that comes to mind is like, I don't know, like sending a kid off to college or something, right? And just like, I'm gonna do that in a year, dude. I, I mean, <laughs> but like, okay, I mean, if you know, kind of like look fast forward your life a little bit, right? I, I, I guess what I'm meaning by that is like, <laughs> like <laughs> if this if this is the last twenty years of your life, Justin <laughs> says, well, <laughs> you do yeah, a scholarship for a kid. Basically just that, that mentorship and that like seeing yeah. somebody take those lessons that you've taught them and kind of like succeed in the world with them, right? Like that, I think that for me is, is what I, I like enjoy like more than What if your kid doesn't want to go to college? He wants to be like his dad. All right, guys, well, thanks for... <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, last, the actual last slide here, uh, other next steps. So highly recommend the Y exercise. Uh, and in addition to that, creating your wealth plan, uh, I mean, you can use this format, right? Kind of the, like the different sections and, and put a basic one together. I would obviously highly recommend checking out Todd's course or at least uh, he's got a huge landing page that explains all this stuff in much more detail or by all this stuff I mean about the course. Like reading through that kind of referencing your, your, uh, your well plan off of that uh, would be great. Personal capital uh, basically tracks your expenses, helps bring awareness to that. Uh, first big step next to your time that you can do. Educate yourself. Begin reading these educational resources. There's so much wisdom, so much gold, and you can't really start to take action until you understand. So again, like going through that now, and this is the perfect thing to do while you're a full-time employee. 
And that's what I spent, you know, the last like three, four times or three, last three to four years doing was in, uh, diving deep into this stuff. Um, and then start saving 50% or more of your net after tax monthly income. This sounds ludicrous, but even on a modest salary, uh, uh, Mr. Money Mustache talks a lot about this in the savings section I mentioned, but that's totally doable. And again, this 50% is not just a function of how much you make, it's a function of how much you make and equally how much you spend. So there's, you know, there's a lot you can do here. Um, and then open and fully contribute to your Roth IRA 401k uh, if they offer matching employer benefits. Thank you guys. Can I ask about the 50% thing? Yes. Um, Actually, no. <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, so how do you do that? At the second you get a, a paycheck, do you take 50% out of that or do you kind of look at how much you've spent, how much you've made, and then equal that out and take 50 that's a good question. So, um, I mean, for me personally, and I was, I mean, just at about 50% down in San Francisco. Uh, right now, I'm definitely not at that. Uh, well, actually, I was the first couple months, but yeah, it's fluctuated a bit. Um, so, what I would recommend doing, like, I just had one giant account that all my money went into, and then I put 10% into, like, a giving fund, which was a separate account. Mm -hmm. And then I, I put, well, now I put 25% into a separate account for taxes, right? And then the left, le leftover is just my savings amount. And then I automatically withdraw a certain amount of money per month into my investments. So I just have this like basically pool of cash that kind of sits there and you know absorbs uh, like all so the transactions. So you don't have a separate uh, savings account versus a checking account? I personally don't necessarily have a, like yeah, I have a bunch of accounts, but I don't, I just kind of have like one main account that everything else funnels into. Mm -hmm. Now that said, most people do have a separate uh, savings mm -hmm. account and that does seem to work better for most people where you have like a set amount that you put aside and then you do a little bit more of a budget I'm a really big fan of the no budget budget, which is <laughs> essentially being aware of your finances and uh, like having your why, uh, like like why you want to like lower your finances, right? Because if you're just like, no, I'm not going to spend that much money on lattes. It's like, it's just, it's not fun, right? It's just like you're like you're, you're, um, you're stealing this pleasure from yourself by not having these lattes. But when it's like, you know what? Like I, I really want to hit this financial independence, right? Or I really want to, meet whatever goal that you've got and you, you know, again, connect that to your emotional why, mm -hmm. then it's like, you get excited. Cause it's like not getting that latte is not like depriving myself of something. It's like, yeah, I mean, that latte is going to turn into whatever <laughs> my, my kids, uh, college fund or you know, whatever, whatever it might be. So it, like, it makes it more exciting. And then by looking at your finances and keeping track of like how much you're spending, you can kind of in the back of your head, like automatically, you know, kind of shy away from spending more money. So one example, opening a personal capital account, I brought my food expenses from about 650 to 700 a month for just myself in San Francisco down to about 250 to 300 per month. And like literally I didn't try to budget, right? Like I was just looking at them like, holy crap, like I do not need to be spending that much money on food. And it just like naturally brought it down to that, that number. Um, I forget what your question was, but hopefully that answered it. <laughs> yeah, and I have another one. It's about um, your, you mentioned your children's retirement fund. Are you saving, have you started saving that for now or? Or the college fund? Plan? That in the future. Like for like for the college fund. Yeah. Um. So that's one of those things that I've modeled out uh, in my wealth plan, mm -hmm. right? Uh, like above the eight k. So like I had like okay when I hit thirty, when I hit thirty two, when I hit thirty six, like the different like rough uh, wealth amounts. But you know the, the thing that I came to is it's like I can barely with any accuracy estimate. <laughs> what having a wife and like what my expense levels are gonna be at 30, <laughs> right? Like I just, I mean, I, I really don't know. So like for me to ex extrude like any further out to like how many kids am I gonna have? What kind of colleges are they gonna wanna go to? How much is inflation gonna, it, it just, it's so much of a stretch mm -hmm. that I'm gonna revisit that as time goes on and I get closer to it. That's all I had for the presentation. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, again, I'm really passionate about this stuff. It's changed my life. I mean, that's why I'm back here you know, now. Uh, and hopefully you guys like got some nugget of wisdom or some inspiration from this. And I, I really, I really hope because uh, I mean, no matter what your goals and situation is, uh, there's a lot you can get out of this. So uh, with that, uh, thank you very much.